Lynette, the floor is yours. Good morning, HGAR members, and welcome to today's Fair Housing event featuring Caroline Downey, General Counsel for New York Division of Human Rights, followed by Crystal Hawkins Siska, our HGAR president, who will have a conversation with landlords Mike O'Connor and LaShawn McCalla on their experiences working with tenants who participate in housing subsidy programs. I'd like to introduce Caroline Downey, an experienced attorney and long-term employee of New York State Division of Human Rights. In 2007, Ms. Downey became general counsel for the Division of Human Rights. As general counsel, she advises the commissioner on all legal matters affecting the division. She supervises the bureau, including the legislation and legal opinions unit, the litigation and appeals unit, and the legal records management unit. She also serves as the division's ethics officer. Ms. Downey joined the division as a legal bureau senior attorney in 1981. After four years as a litigation associate with the New York City law firm of, of Hawkins, Delafia, and Wood, she first served in the Appeals and Litigation Unit in the division where she litigated many discrimination cases in the appellate divisions, where she litigated in the Court of Appeals, including Binghamton Federal Credit Union versus SDHR which establishes that the denial of credit disability insurance to pregnant women constituted sex discrimination in the orphan of credit under the human rights law. And SDHR versus Onondaga Sheriff's Department where the Court of Appeals in a race and sex discrimination case recognized that an employee's shift in explanation was employment actions may give rise to an inference that later explanations are pretextual. In 1992, Ms. Downey was promoted to the position of Director of Litigation and Legal Opinions for the division, where her responsibilities included overseeing the division's legislative and regulatory programs. Ms. Downey promoted was promoted to supervising attorney for the division in June 2005. The position she held until she until her promotion to general counsel. Ms. Downey lectures frequently in all areas involving interpretation of the human rights law. Ms. Downey is a graduate of Lake Erie College for Women and the Antioch School of Law. Ms. Downey. Hey, thank you so much, Lynette. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, the trouble with having worked at the agency so long is that I have a long bio. I usually just run, uh, round it up to I work, I've worked here a hundred years and let it go at that. But thank you so much. And, and I really appreciate being here today and, and speaking to you on these important topics and, and very much appreciate the uh, efforts of your organization to make sure its membership is up to date on everything that's been happening because a lot has been happening, as you know. Um, so I think we're gonna switch over to a um, PowerPoint presentation. There we go. So you don't have to look at me so much. Uh, and um, we'll, we'll proceed with this. This is going to be available to you. Um, as you can see, I'm going to cover lawful source of income. I know that's of great interest to everyone and that'll certainly be the bulk of what we do. But we wanna bring in other recent human rights law amendments too that impact housing and housing providers and realtors uh, because whenever I have a captive audience, we wanna bring them up to date on everything that's going on out there. So, um, okay, we can, we can move along, I think. Um, human rights law even preceded me. Uh, it was uh, 1945 was the original um, uh, statute. It was a predecessor statute to the human rights law. And uh, so we celebrated our 75th anniversary uh, last year and really pre uh, uh, preceded any kind of federal law 
before um, any other state law was the first in the country. Housing provisions were uh, began to be added in 1955. 1945 was largely employment, uh, and 55 was housing. So as you can see, was well in advance of federal law in that 66 years ago. These are the categories that we cover under the human rights law and uh, in housing. And I'm not gonna discuss them all in detail, but I want you all to know uh, that they all exist. Uh, so just uh, not, not surprises here, age discrimination and under New York law, that's 18 and over. Uh, so it isn't just uh, older age discrimination, any kind of um, creed and, and uh, religious discrimination, disability, including reasonable accommodation and reasonable modification of premises uh, is part of that. Discuss that briefly in a bit. Uh, familial status, that's the status of having um, children under the age of 18 or being pregnant. Um, a race color, of course, has, has long been in it from the beginning. And um, there's a new uh, aspect to it that I'm gonna discuss a little bit later having to do with racial, uh, racially related hairstyles. Uh, marital status is covered, uh, divorced, single, married, widowed, those kinds of status. Uh, military status is covered, national origin, which includes uh, uh, ancestry, uh, sex, which includes sexual harassment and pregnancy. Pregnancy is included in several other parts of the law. Uh, it's really, really against the law, pregnancy discrimination. Of course, sexual harassment is, uh, we, we see more of that in the employment context, but we have many cases in the housing context as well. And it's certainly unlawful. Sexual orientation has been part of our law since 2002. Uh, when I say new, these are relatively new, the next three, and it's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, they're from 2019. Uh, gender identity expression, uh, new arrest record and law and, and uh, arrest record, which is also new and lawful source of income, which is new. The uh, human rights law, is, these are, will just be for your use right. later on. It's, it's codified as article uh, 15 of the executive law. Uh, we call it the human rights law, but it's really the executive law. It's familiarly known as the human rights law and it's sections 290 and uh, uh, following. Then we have rules of practice at 465. Our general regulations are at 9 NYCRR 466. And these include regulations as a reasonable accommodation association and gender identity. We are not a largely regulatory agency because we are an adjudicatory agency, but these are areas in which we have issued regulations and coming soon, um, and this will impact all of you, regulations that require housing providers and realtors, anyone associated with housing provision uh, to provide notice to tenants and potential, potential tenants of their rights to reasonable accommodations uh, for, for persons with disabilities. So these have been proposed in the state register uh, currently in the comment period. The comment period is actually closed now. We've been reviewing comments and we'll be republishing in the state rec, uh, register pretty shortly. So keep an eye out for those because that's all going to be required of any kind of housing providers or their agents. Um, and all of this is available on the division website too and more information about all of those. So um, these are what we're going to cover today. I've covered just a little bit of it anyway. Um, we talk about the liberal construction law. I'm gonna talk about that first, lawful source of income. Uh, protection based on the basis of prior arrest or sealed convictions, that's new. Gender identity or expression, relatively new. It's been covered in other areas, so it's not as new. The hairstyles associated with race, reasonable accommodation for assistance animals and procedures following a final determination. So we'll get into each of those. So the first of these is uh, the liberal construction statute that's in the human rights law, it's section 300. And it reads as, um, as indicated there. And it's been in the law for a long time since I've known it. It's, the law was always to be construed liberally. And I'm, I talk about this because it's going to impact how we're looking at source of income discrimination as it comes to us. So that I'm not just being a law professor here. It's important that the legislature has said the law is to be construed liberally, which as I say, it is said for decades. But in 2019, it became um, even more pointed 
um, because then the, it was amended to add that the uh, laws to be interpreted liberally to accomplish its remedial purposes. So recognize that this is a remedial law. That is, it's to remedy a wrong in our society that exists. And that's regardless of whether federal civil rights laws, including similar ones like the Fair Housing Act in our circumstances have been so construed. So there's a, there's a fair, federal line of cases and there's a state line of cases and the state line is not um, going to uh, be um, in any way foreshortened by anything that the federal cases do. This was accepted law by the way, but it has now been codified. And then the other part of this exemption, exceptions to and exemptions from the provisions of this article shall be narrowly construed in order to maximize deterrence of discriminatory conduct. So any exemptions that they are, um, the legislature is telling us they're to be narrowly construed. So I want, and, and just on the next slide, I have a couple of cases about what liberal construction means. Doesn't have anything to do with politics. It just means a broad construction. And uh, you know, how is that applied? And there are some cases here from New York statute law and quoted in a couple of cases that you can look at if you like. But basically it's not just, you know, um, kind of a, you know, crunchy granola kind of context. It's one that is in the interest of those whose rights are be, to be protected. So that's people who've been discriminated against under the human rights law. And if a case is within the beneficial intention of a remedial act, it is deemed within the statute, even though it's not within the letter of the law. And that's what I want you to think of when I start talking about the various ways that source of income, uh, we, we interpret source of income as we go along. Um, so just uh, very basically, who, who does it apply to? This was 2019, it applies to everybody. Um, how is publicly assisted housing, private housing, separate section for real estate brokers, real estate salespersons, or any employee or agent thereof. And by the way, we have a great new uh, source of income guidance on, not new, not so new anymore. Uh, it's been with us for a while uh, on our website. Uh, I'm covering most of what's in that guidance, but there are other examples in that guidance that you may uh, wanna look at. You should, it's a eight pages long. It's, it's we have been told that it's quite useful and we intended it to be uh, for both um, complainants and, and um, for both housing you know, tenants and housing providers and realtors. So it applies to everybody. It applies to owners, landlords, managing agents, co-op boards, condos, tenants seeking to sublet. So you wanna sublet your apartment, you're considered a housing provider for these purposes, for all purposes under the human rights law and uh, you would have to uh, abide by the source of income and other uh, provisions of the human rights law. Real estate brokers and salespersons, any employee or agent of the above. And what is source of income? So it, it's described in the statute. Uh, there are examples given in the statute, but very important, the statute refers to these uh, categories as being inclusive, but not limiting. So. We have child support, alimony, spousal maintenance, foster care subsidies, social security benefits, any kind of federal, state, or local public assistance, any kind of federal, state, or local housing assistance, including section eight, and that's right in there, or any other type of voucher or any form of housing assistance, regardless of whether paid to the tenant or to the landlord, any other lawful source of income. So very, very broad, as I said. Okay, so what, what is in lawful? Well, it's unlawful to do the kinds of things that would be unlawful under any other basis, such as race or sex or religion or any other basis under the human rights law. So that's refusing to sell rent or lease, otherwise denying housing. Uh, that's, that's fairly evident. Providing different terms, conditions, or privileges. And I'm gonna talk about that a little more in a minute um, because it is, um, that that's where some interesting issues coming up uh, are coming up. Denying use of facilities or services. That's again, right in the statute. Make any advertisement, publication, statement, inquiry, anything, record, use a form or, or just talk about which expresses any intent to discriminate or to limit in any way and uh, refusing to negotiate for sale, rental or lease by a real estate professional or any of these other kinds of things relative to advertising, et cetera. So um, what, is, what do we mean by differing terms, conditions, and privileges? That's kind of a, 
term of art throughout the human rights law and throughout anti-discrimination law generally. Uh, but it, uh, everything has to be equal. Differing terms, conditions, or privileges is going to be considered unlawful. So can't deny the use of any facilities that are open to non-subsidized tenants. And I give some examples here. Uh, roof gardens, exercise facilities, et cetera. Um, subsidized tenants must gain the same access to building, parking, storage, uh, accorded to other tenants on the same terms. So there may be some fees for some of these kinds of things. They have to be available to subsidized tenants as well. Uh, housing providers can't refuse to uh, or, or have different uh, schedules for making repairs or otherwise maintain the premises differently because there's a housing subsidy involved in the payment. Now, the, another section that I mentioned had to do with advertisements and statements. The, these we used to see a lot because until 2019 across the state, although there were many localities, as you were aware, that made a source of income uh, unlawful, so source of income discrimination unlawful prior to uh, the state law. So when I say these were lawful, these were lawful under the human rights law until they weren't. So landlords would say no section eight, no vouchers, no subsidy. Now, of course, that is itself a per se violation of the law. We saw some of those to begin with. We don't see those as much. Um, and you know, I'm sure from none of you will though there be that kind of advertising uh, scene. But there can be uh, you know, any kind of other non-acceptance of lawful source of income, such as you know, child support, disability, that, that's unlawful too. And I'm gonna talk a little at the end, if I have time about our process, I'll talk a little bit about it anyway, when I get there, but I may make it quite brief. Um, but when a complaint is filed with us, when there's this kind of per se violation, we really don't need any additional investigation and, and uh, we'll issue a probable cause determination. The matter will go for a trial before an ALJ and an ultimate decision by the commissioner unless the matter's settled, which by the way, they usually are because there's basically no defense to uh, that kind of uh, advertisement that is on its face unlawful. Um, the, um, those are direct. <laughs> those kinds of actions are direct. But, and this is where we're talking about our section 300 liberal construction to some degree. Um, even without a direct statement that vouchers are not accepted, um, that there could be indirect actions that will be unlawful. They may not be as immediately evident, but they, after investigation, uh, may well be shown to be unlawful. So refusal to rent because of source of income can consist of other actions, such as happening to offer fewer housing options. And, and we have a division initiated case. We have a unit that initiates its own case that are systemic in nature uh, that, that involve just such a circumstance where a, um, a uh, online provider, uh, if you clicked, you had, that you, you clicked one what you want, you might find a hundred possibilities. If you said you had a housing voucher, you might find zero or one or two. Uh, that you know that kind of filter would be unlawful. So and and certainly anything uh, that is limiting by realtors or housing providers offering fewer options. But then it gets more subtle than that: delaying review of applications, not responding equally or at all, ghosting people who have those kinds of subsidies, any other practice that creates a barrier to housing for subsidized tenants. And and as we'll talk about, it can be direct or indirect. The, um, I, where we've been asked uh, that whether, you know, there, there, are, there are administrative requirements. I, mean, I forget we've been asked. We've been, we've been asked whether that's an excuse for not um, doing, uh, having uh, subsidized uh, uh, tenants. Uh, and the answer is no. Um, housing providers have to comply with the administrative requirements of the program, must make any policy changes required by the pro program, any uh, repairs must be made um, based on the administering agency's inspection. This is just to bring things up to code, uh, that, that which, which should be in any, in any event. Uh, and there's raised, as I said, by housing providers potential um, undue burden, which is the next slide there. Thanks. So this is actually, I, you know, I will talk a little bit, we haven't had a lot of law in this area generally, and I'll let you know when we have, I'll bring it up in our slides. 
Uh, this is a developing area of the law, which is why I want you to always think of it in terms of its liberal construction requirements. But there, this is an area of the law that has uh, been uh, decided. And basically there is no undue burden defense for housing providers or realtors to the, uh, with respect to the administrative requirements. And we have a, a first department case there and a Southern District of New York case there. Uh, and, and basically um, you can't discriminate because of any potential undue burden. Now, this particular law just doesn't contain an undue burden defense. It was not written into it by the legislature. And it was, uh, and, and the legislature, by the way, knows how to write undue burden or undue hardship defenses in the law because it has with respect to reasonable accommodation in housing, as you know, probably, and as to reasonable accommodation uh, in employment for, for disability uh, and, and, and those issues that they, they discuss what an undue hardship or an undue burden might be. There is no such aspect to this law. And it would, it would defeat the law, of course, if, if, uh, if landlords could just say, oh, it's too hard, I don't wanna do it. So next slide there. Um, so basically, and again, we have law supporting this from the first department and the fourth department, which are the two of the appellate divisions in our state. Uh, basically, participation in housing subsidies is no longer voluntary. Now the section eight program, for example, are, it's voluntary in nature, but if you look at that second, uh, second case there and from the fourth department, uh, despite the voluntary nature of section eight, state and local law may properly provide additional protections, uh, even if those protections could limit an owner's ability to refuse to participate in an otherwise voluntary program. Uh, and again, that is basically because it would defeat the purpose of the law if, if, the law, if, if it could just be, you know, too, it's too hard. So this is where, um, where we always have a lot of interest <laughs> from, uh, from everybody, and, and we should. These are important areas. And as I said, uh, the, this is an undeveloped area as yet. And so you'll see in the guidance that we've put out you know, our, our interpretation of it, and we've given you know, legal interpretation by courts because our cases go through courts once we're done with them, or they can if people appeal. Uh, and you know we'll we'll get that at, over time, but we have a law to deal with now. And I was uh, just looking, uh, at, or just been provided with with some of our numbers on source of income, just so you kind of know what we're dealing with. Um, and and uh, we've had a hundred and this the last time we looked a little a couple weeks ago, one hundred and eighty seven uh, complaints based on source of income filed around the state. Almost uh, twenty percent of all our housing uh, discrimination cases now. Uh, about 105 of these have been resolved and, and uh, 23 have been settled. Others have, uh, and, and the amounts of those settlements are the total about $70,000. Uh, others have um, found, uh, dis been dismissed for no probable cause. Others have been found, have found probable cause and they'll go to a hearing. And that is where we will develop the law. Uh, the commissioner will issue an order that will, uh, as to the particulars of that case, and it'll go up to court. So we haven't gotten to that stage yet. And so some of this, we are using you know, other areas of the law or the uh, interpretation that I've, that, that I've just discussed. So as a general matter, and this is just general law, uh, discrimination law, uh, any kind of requirements, and, and this goes to income, wealth, credit history, they can't be used as a reason to avoid the law, which is the first little section there, so that would be direct um, in, intentional discrimination, if you will, or have the effect of frustrating the purpose of the law, which may not be intentional or might appear not to be intentional, but has an effect. And that is a basic tenet of, of the law, disparate impact kind of, uh, of legal analysis. So an apparently neutral policy that is equally applied. So, you know, what's the harm in that? We're telling everybody the same thing, but it has the effect of excluding people with rental vouchers or other assistance or other forms of lawful income. That's going to have the purpose of uh, the effect rather, not perhaps the purpose, but the effect of frustrating the law. And that is going to be unlawful in the circumstances as they arise. 
So uh, first off, let's talk about income and assets, which is what you know people look at when they're renting or buying, and it applies to all that. Um, a home, a, a, this is what housing providers and realtors look at. So the kinds of things that can be asked, certainly the amount of income, the source of income may certainly be asked, and do, a documentation um, of, of the income. So none of that is different from what you do, I shouldn't think. However, the analysis of the ability to pay can't be used as that subterfuge, as I mentioned, to discriminate on the basis of source of income or have that effect of, of discriminating. And with tenants with vouchers, for example, determining the ability to pay the, the uh, tenant's portion has been made by the vouchering agency after a very careful analysis. These are intended to work. These are not intended to fail. And they usually do work, by the way. Uh, and and it, it, the, the, the factors that go in to how much a tenant has to pay, how much the tenant's income is, um, that those have all been worked out by the housing provider. So if a housing provider were to deny tenancy based on that same information, that would just, that wouldn't be reasonable on its face and would appear to have the effect of negating the law. And that's how we're going to uh, look at, at these things. Um, income and wealth requirements generally. So all lawful sources of income must be accepted equally. Can't, and this, this was true even before this change, uh, can't require only attachable income such as wages, which, which can be garnished. And that, as I say, was true even before this because that would likely uh, have a discriminatory impact on people with disabilities who may not be able to work or work to that extent and may have income uh, that is not from wages. So um, any kind of unreasonable income or wealth requirements may not be utilized because after all, people are getting vouchers because they have low income and lack wealth. Unreasonable requirements could exclude everybody with a voucher and negate the law. And you know, we're basically talking about income of rental formulas that may be reasonable if required, if required of non-subsidized tenants if they're applied to tenants with subsidies, they're not gonna be reasonable. They're getting the subsidy because they don't have enough income to pay the entire rent. Um, credit history. Um, this is, this is a, a tricky area. It, it, we really want individual uh, consideration of tenants here. I mean, that's, that's what you're gonna to need to show and any kind of credit history, you know, cutoff of whatever it might be uh, in whatever, you know, number that might be is, is that's not going to work uh, largely. Um, it, and credit history reports can't be used in a way, as I say, that is going to be applied equally, but has the effect of negating the purpose. And we know credit history may not be a valid or reasonable indicator of whether a person will pay the rent, well, sometimes people have bad credit histories because they paid the rent first and that may not show up on the credit history. So that, that's, a, that's one reason it's not reasonable. And certainly, for example, and we give some others in the guidance, if a voucher covers 100% of the rent, consideration of a negative credit history uh, would be unreasonable. And, and similarly, um, you know, for smaller, if a person pays 10 or 20 or 30% of the rent, just as with, uh, showing the person's um, ability to pay that amount uh, would be based on that 10, 20, 30 percent. Um, the credit history would be uh, equally less, um, less telling of whether the person can pay that 10, 20, 30 percent. And uh, another area that, that comes up uh, occasionally on, on this is um, whether you have a tenant who didn't use a subsidy, and uh, now wants to, and was a false pretext, whatever, a housing provider must accept a voucher even of, a, of a current tenant, an existing tenant. And here we have, again, some, uh, some uh, appellate division law on this, must accept a newly obtained voucher of an existing tenant. So those are basically the areas I wanna cover in, in source of income, and I'll take your questions at the end um, but there are just some other areas, and I have a few more minutes to do it, uh, that I really want to cover because they've gotten sort of less press and are really important. And I want everybody to be um, 
to, to know, you know what's out there. And one of the major one were these arrest provisions. Uh, again, it covers, um, and, and it was really 2019, the arrest provisions were expanded to housing. It used to just be in employment and uh, licensing, and now it's, it's housing. And it covers, again, everybody who is on, um, on that list there, everybody we've already talked about, everybody covered by the human rights law. <laughs> so um, what's protected by this, these arrest provisions? And I wanna say, I'll get to that in two seconds, but, and I get to this point in a later slide, but I think it's important to know upfront, if anybody, if anybody has any, you can't ask about any of this stuff is basically the requirement of the arrest provisions of the human rights law. In that, so you can't ask about any of this information. And if you happen to know that information from some other source other than asking, you can't take in, it into account uh, in making your decision about renting uh, or uh, other kind of housing provision. So uh, what are we talking about when we talk about the arrest provisions? And I wanna distinguish that from other provisions of our law that talk specifically about criminal convictions but we, what we refer by these arrest provisions, which are in 296.16 of the human rights law, more than just arrests are protected. So um, it, it, it doesn't cover, it does cover any arrests or any criminal accusation or proceeding which has been resolved in the individual's favor. Okay, that's big. So it's not pending, right? Can't be pending because it has to have been resolved in the person's favor for that section. So if, however, there's a pending arrest with adjudications in contemplation of dismissal, which is quite typical uh, uh, for, for relatively minor matters, uh, they're called ACDs. And uh, if you don't, if, if uh, there's an ACD and six months, it's usually a six month period, I believe, uh, no additional incident at that time, at the end of six months, the, the case is dismissed. The legislature changed this a little bit in the last year. To, uh, two years ago to say that pending arrests under these circumstances, even though they haven't been dismissed, are covered by the human, human rights law. And any kind of youthful offender adjudications, which are not considered convictions, uh, and, but come in under this section of the law. And a variety of sealed convictions. And the next couple of slides, I've kept it in here uh, for your information. I'm not gonna go over this, but um, just a lot, just for your, for your awareness, a lot of material can be, a lot of, um, of adjudicatory actions uh, can be sealed. And they can be sealed under various sections of the law, um, that certain uh, drug-related offenses, violations, um, youthful offenders are automatically sealed. Um, so uh, without getting into the details of that, there's a lot of areas that can't be asked about can't be acted upon, cannot be a reason to deny housing. So the inquiries themselves are unlawful. And background checks may, may, show, um, may show sealed convictions uh, and, and complainant uh, may need to document, provide documentation to provide it sealed, but you can't just rely on, on background checks. You have to at least be able to give the complainant an opportunity or the potential tenant an opportunity. So again, these, these, it's, it's kind of a tricky area. It's a new area and can't be a reason to deny housing. Uh, last slide with this particular section. So as I said, you may not even ask about arrests, proceedings, or prior convictions that are covered by this section of the law. Can't ask and can't take any action. And this was new in 2019. If such a question is asked, and this is a direct quote from the statute, the individual may respond as if the arrest, criminal accusation, or disposition of such arrest or criminal accusation did not occur. That means you've asked an unlawful question, they may answer it in the negative because it was unlawful. And that cannot later become a reason for denying housing. It can't be called lying on the application because it was in fact an unlawful question. And this pertains to employment as well. So this was, a, this was a big uh, change or recognition of reality, really, uh, with, respect, with respect to this law. I'll take any questions about arrest records as well uh, when we get to that section. 
So I uh, wanted to cover a few other areas uh, that are, are new uh, to the law or relatively new. Gender identity expression uh, was specifically added in 2019, but it was not new uh, in that the uh, human rights law prior to this time had provided protection for this area uh, under either sex uh, and or in certain circumstances, disability. Um, and now, and so in 2019, it became specific in, in the law. Uh, and then all areas of jurisdiction were amended uh, to add gender identity. And in the next slide, you'll see what the definition of gender identity is directly from the law. Um, so it's basically, as it says there, actual or perceived gender identity, including in those, those examples. Um, there's a lot of information on our website about this if you want to follow up, but there's guidance on gender identity protections that's uh, quite useful and, and quite detailed. Another new area of the law, and this may include, this may be more pertinent to employment than housing, but it pertains to all sections of our law. Um, and that, that is now uh, that discrimination is unlawful on the basis of hairstyles associated with race. Now, again, this is something that the division would have covered even without the amendment. Again, theories of adverse impact that I was discussing earlier, if there's a policy you have to wear your hair a certain way, uh, does it have an adverse impact or is it in fact intentionally, in, uh, either unintentionally or perhaps intentionally uh, to exclude certain persons and that's now unlawful. Uh, in the next slide, this is what uh, the statute says, because uh, race is not otherwise defined in our law uh, from a definitional standpoint, um, but uh, traits historically associated with race, including uh, hair texture, protective hairstyles, which have been, um, uh, there's again, a non-inclusive list there in the next, and that is also in the statute. In, in 2020, uh, there was a change to our reasonable accommodation section of the law having to do with um, an, uh, uh, animals uh, that alleviate the symptoms of a disability. They can be called you know, comfort animals. Uh, some, you know, there, there are many names for them. In the statute, it says animals to, that are used to alleviate the symptoms of a disability. And this amendment clarified a broad standard to apply it in these standards, which, which had been recognized in most cases in 2019. In the next slide, uh, we have a couple of um, uh, cases that show because there had been a history in one of the appellate divisions in this state of interpreting our law very narrowly, not liberal construction, uh, as to uh, the use of animals in a housing, uh, in a housing context. And uh, in Delcap management, you can see there that there was an appellate division case that was reversed uh, by the court of appeals. The appellate division had held that the companion dog, um, that the showing that the companion dog helped the tenant with her symptoms uh, did not prove the dog was actually necessary in order for her to use and enjoy the premises. Uh, we appealed that to the uh, court of appeals and the division's final order, finding the housing provider failed the accommodation request. Uh, was reinstated by the uh, Court of Appeals. And there are a couple of other cases there um, too. And you can see in that last case, the second department, which it had applied the narrower version of this, uh, it came to a different result in the Tom's Point case there at the end. There was a uh, section uh, that was also changed this past year, uh, having to do with procedures after dismissal. So in some cases, in some ways, this doesn't evolve, uh, involve the division of human rights so much, but it may involve you or your clients. Um, it, um, the uh, human rights law was amended to provide that where we've dismissed a case for lack of probable cause or lack of jurisdiction, the complainant may either seek judicial review, which is uh, in court, which is what is, was currently commit, uh, permitted and still is permitted, or bring a de novo action in court um, under, uh, on the underlying claim. So that is, uh, again, you may be seeing cases that we've dismissed no probable cause uh, being brought in state court again as a new action. And you'll say, well, what the heck, am I looking at this again? Uh, and the NPC, the no probable cause of division issued is not binding on the court, but I will say the courts have tended, you know, if we don't find probable cause, 
it's going to be a hard case for the complainant uh, to prove. We, when these cases are appealed, uh, they are um, almost invariably upheld, but this would be a, a new case in court. So you may see some of those. Um, okay, then I think I just would like to take a few minutes, because I think I have a few left, uh, to talk a little bit about our complaint process, which I've referred to, but I want it set out here, and there's lots more information about our, our, our process on our website. But um, just so you know what we do, uh, and we've been around forever, but that still doesn't mean people know exactly what we do. Um, we have regional offices around the state. Uh, I know you are largely a Westchester organization. We have an office in White Plains uh, and, and you know, several in the city, one in Albany, Buffalo, Binghamton, I've left Long Island, certainly a couple. Uh, and and uh, I've, oh, I left out Rochester and Syracuse, but you get the idea. There are regional offices all around the state. Um, we can, but complaints can be filed on the division's website. Um, we've, uh, one of the changes recently that I haven't gotten into here because it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a, a thing of detail, but um, the uh, complaints may be filed that we used to require a notary uh, signature to file a complaint, a verified complaint. That is no longer the case. That was changed legislatively so that we can um, just have that uh, filed with a, with a basically a, a, an oath that is not sworn to in front of a notary because how do you find a notary nowadays? Um, we had always provided those services, but things have changed so much during the pandemic that it really is um, reasonable to just um, affirm the case. And that is all information on our website now. So a complaint has to be filed within a year. Uh, there are an exception to that uh, with respect to sex harassment in employment, but um, the, uh, it would, to file with the division, it's a year, can file directly in state court, which is a little different from what I was just talking about a second ago. Uh, if you don't come here, you can file directly in state court under the human rights law, which sometimes people do, or people bring uh, pendant or supplemental claims in federal court. You may have seen those uh, to bring their state causes of action in federal court as well. Uh, you can't file both at the division and in state court. When we get a complaint, uh, we investigate it. And um, we do that as promptly as we can. Things were held up a bit during the pandemic, but have, we've really, really gotten back uh, to speed some time ago. Um, we wanna see uh, what, what, what we need to investigate. And the regulations of the division, which I referred to earlier, uh, provide that there's really a lot of leeway for the regional director in any case as to how a, an investigation will be made, field visit, witness interview, written oral inquiry, conference, any other method uh, deemed suitable by the uh, regional director. Um, once there has been all the evidence has been gathered, the regional director makes a determination as to whether there's probable cause, there's already we don't get to the probable cause determination unless we've already determined that there's jurisdiction. We'll dismiss it earlier based on lack of jurisdiction if we haven't done that. If there's no probable cause, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, complaint is dismissed and the complainant may seek judicial review or as of January of this year, go straight into court, as I just mentioned. After probable cause, the case is forward to a public hearing before an administrative law judge. Uh, or in cases of housing discrimination, uh, following probable cause, either party may elect to have the uh, case heard in state court. A public hearing uh, is, is, um, is a trial, and it's before we have a dozen or so administrative law judges around the state uh, and uh, who hold a trial uh, that is ultimately decided by the commissioner of human rights, but at the trial, um, material issues uh, of fact are in law resolved, anything that couldn't be uh, resolved previously, testimony taken under oath, witnesses are subject to cross-examination, a full record is made. Uh, these are usually scheduled for two days uh, and they sometimes take longer, sometimes less, uh, but it is a, quite a formal proceeding for an administrative proceeding which are intended to be um, expeditious. Um, so complainant may have his or her own attorney or a division attorney appointed to present the case in support of the complaint. Uh, and the ALJ uh, submits an order to a recommended order to the commissioner 
And as um, I mentioned, it's the commissioner of human rights who issues all final orders after reviewing these submissions, evidence recommended order, issues a final order, either finding discrimination or dismissing the complaint, the commissioner can accept the ALJ's recommendation or not. It is, it is the commissioner's uh, choice on that. And then the remedies um, uh, in housing, and, and they're, they're significant. The remedies in human rights law are significant generally, but certainly making the housing at issue available uh, making reasonable accommodations or modifications as, as uh, found not to have, have happened. Compensation for mental anguish, which by the way, has no limit. Under federal law, there's a limit of, uh, for that of $300,000. Uh, there's no limit uh, under the human rights law. Uh, there's compensation for out-of-pocket expenses. Um, there's uh, punitive damages, uh, which uh, are, are not limited at at, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in court, uh, there's civil fines up to $100,000. And this is a fine that goes to the state of New York. Um, and the, the, uh, the way the statute is, is set up, it's uh, up to $50,000 for any kind of uh, regular discrimination, if you will, and up to $100,000 for any discrimination that's found to have been uh, willful, wanton, or malicious is the phrase that's in. The statute. So $100,000 potential liability there, uh, requiring the housing provider and staff to attend anti-discrimination training, uh, any kind of order, of course, in any event to, to cease the discriminatory practice, attorney's fees, and any other related or reasonable uh, relief. And you know, I will say in that, um, in that context, we work closely with the Department of State. I know this is of interest to, to realtors, uh, who are um, licensed by the Department of State. And we work closely with the Department of State when cases are filed, uh, they do with us. Uh, and you know, we, we have an obligation to let them know, uh, you know when these kinds of things are going on. So it, it is a, we are uh, sister state agencies uh, pursuing in many cases the same goals, which is the prevention of housing discrimination. So I think I've gone quite long enough. We can listen to anybody for more than 45 minutes. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Caroline. A couple of questions, and please put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, first, could you elaborate a little bit about what you talked about on background checks and the sealed and arrest uh, provisions of the housing law? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it used to be you'd do a background, or I don't know, I, I can't say, I don't know enough about how housing works to really say that, but if, if background checks were used, it would sort of be a shield. And, and, you know, because in, in housing, because there were no separate protections in housing. Employers had been dealing with this for a while, but there were no separate protections. So, uh, so the background checks may show sealed convictions. And, and you know, you're gonna, the, those two slides that I didn't spend a lot of time on, because they're kind of particular, uh, you know, you may, you may need to get some advice on. Um, but, you know, I think if they show sealed convictions, um, and as we say here, complaining can, can provide documentation to establish it's sealed, as it may, you know, then they should be asked about. Uh, and, and, you know, just shouldn't be um, across the board. Well, it's on the background check, therefore it must be so. Because it may be that those are not things that are supposed to be asked about. And background checks, I think, can be pretty much of a, a big old uh, hammer uh, on a little tiny nail. So, uh, you know, they can be very large and they're not necessarily as discreet as, uh, you know, the, the, I don't mean in sense of discretion, but not as, as narrowly tailored as they should be. And, you know, to, to rely on a background check organization without giving them, you know, what you need and you don't want sealed convictions that come under those kinds of sealing um, aspects of the law. Thank you, Caroline. And another question about uh, what you said about credit scores. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about why or, or about credit history and about uh, uh, reasonableness? Yeah, well, you know, that word reasonable doesn't make anybody happy, right? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, I think you have, you know, you look the way we're looking at it going forward and, you know, we need some of these cases to really and then we'll decide cases within the context of specific, um, uh, you know, circumstances. Um, but I think it comes back to, you know, we all sort of rely on things that we do 
because we've always done them that way. And, and credit scores might come in and, as that as well. Uh, and if, um, again, if it's unre, you know, a person may have terrible credit, but not be paying very much of the, the rent. So what difference does it make? That's between, you know, them and Visa, right? Um, but, you know, so why, why is that a, a function of whether you can pay rent? It's the example we give here, but that's, you know, just the most evident example. If it, there's 100% of the rent, how could it be reasonable to consider a negative credit history? The rent is going to be paid. In fact, the rent is paid, uh, you know, more, um, more regularly than we with jobs sometimes pay our rent because we can lose jobs, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's not an answer that I can do a bright line on. Um, and, and, but remember the vouchering agency has decided what this person can pay, reasonably pay. And the person is going to want to pay that to keep the voucher because they have to do that. You can't not pay your part of the rent, you lose the voucher. So I, I can't really elaborate. We haven't had a lot of cases in that, but we are again looking is, is there, are there ways that this is going to be seen as a way of discouraging the law, uh, the purpose of the law, which is remedial in effect so that people can get housing uh, in, in this state. And uh, that, so if credit history is standing in its way in any particular circumstances, uh, it, it, and, and particularly since it may not be a reasonable indicator of whether the person's gonna pay the rent, and particularly since 70% of it is usually being paid by, um, but, you know, directly, most of the time directly, maybe not most of the time, but certainly a lot of the time directly. So it, it, that is not a satisfactory answer. I understand that, but I, that's why I started with what our uh, overarching theme is here, which is a, a liberal construction of the law. How do we work together to make this law work? Thank you, Caroline. I, I do think that does help. And just remember, we do have guidance that goes into a little bit more depth on our yeah. website, and we'll put links to that into the chat. Thank you. We got a, a couple of questions about who our law, I guess, really applies to. So one question about, well, a two-family owner-occupied house, is that exempt? What about a single-family home that's rented out? And would realtors or real estate agents still be covered in those situations? Right. Um, okay. Single family homes, we cover. There's, there's no question um, in, in the sale or rental. And I think that may differ from the Fair Housing Act. I don't know. I think it does. Uh, and the Fair Housing Act, as you probably know, is for family owner occupied houses. So again, we have a, a different kind of exemption that is more limiting for landlords. And it's two family owner occupied owner occupied, not the owner's third cousin, owner occupied. Um, and so there is an exemption for that, but, um, but not for advertising for that. And that, that is, that is uh, you know, that's an exemption that you lose. So two family owner occupied are exempt from the law, but realtors can't go in and advertise for them or anything like that. Uh, and the single families are included. Caroline. And then we got, a, I guess, a couple of questions about what is covered under lawful source of income. Uh, I think you were pretty clear, pretty, pretty broad list here that we have. But what about things yeah. like the new ERAP program? Uh, is that a lawful source of income? Yeah, I, uh, you know, that's, uh, we haven't had those cases. Um, so again, I won't speak to it directly, but I will reiterate that any lawful source of income and it includes, but is not limited to any other lawful source of income. And, and uh, it would seem to me that would certainly, uh, you know, ERAP is a lawful source of income, but we have not had that case yet. Great. And then uh, I guess a, a, to be clear, the arrest and uh, sealed records provisions are pretty specific on, on what is covered. Um, and I think, you know, the list they, here is pretty exhaustive. 
<laughs> and pretty uh, it is it is pretty and, clear. It's, and you, you right if you look at 296 16 of the law which i recommend even though it's one long paragraph of about i don't know a thousand words and you have to you know worm your way through it kind of sometimes the legislature doesn't make it easy uh, and this is a law that's just been added to over the years so they uh, you know, so bits are added and you really have to read the whole thing. And that's why I tried to set out here for you to look at later if you need to, you know, what the legislature is really talking about, about the, uh, you know, the sealed uh, convictions. And it goes between our law and the criminal procedure law about what is considered sealed. Mostly it's misdemeanors that are sealed, I think almost entirely. It's misdemeanors that are able to be sealed that way. And, uh, you know, and, and it really makes sense because if people can't get employment, and, and again, this applies to employment and licensing as well as housing. And if people can't get employment and housing because of something that happened, you know, a long time ago and was relatively minor um, and, and has been sealed, and you'll see, you know, certain drug-related defenses, a lot of those go back, uh, as I recall, to the, what, what it was known as the Rockefeller drug laws that were so draconian and you know, many people had convictions for what is now legal in the state of New York, marijuana, right? So you know, these are things that you just want to not have get in the way. Um, and then you can see there under that fourth bullet in that 2017, a wide variety of offenses may be sealed, but there are qualifying circumstances. So I, again, I'm not talking about any particular case, but can't have more than two convictions, uh, you, 10 years elapsed from release to incarceration, excludes sex crimes, serious violent crimes. And then if you go to that section, detailed procedures for obtaining sealing. So um, I, don't, I, I don't mean that you all need to become, uh, you know, criminal defense lawyers or knowledgeable in that, I'm certainly not. But that's, you know, that's why I think you want to be just very careful about the kinds of questions you're asking, because these are things you don't even want to ask about. So you can, you know, tell, you know, you can tell them to exclude anything that's sealed or that kind of thing. There are various ways of doing it. Thank you, Caroline. We have a couple of more minutes. Uh, so I just want to get to one area that maybe we didn't touch as much. Someone asked, well, what can you ask about comfort or support animals? Or I guess about reasonable accommodation. Right, okay, no, that's a good question. Um, so basically, you know, you're, you, there needs to be some medical evidence that the person needs this for a disability. So, and, but you know, disability is interpreted very broadly under the human rights law, much more broadly than under federal law, under employment law, even more broadly than under the Fair Housing Act. It, it, you know, we used to, to joke uh, the, um, you know, it, is the common cold included? And I'd say, well, no, we like a little chest congestion, you know, but it really is anything that you're going to, um, it, you know, from an employment context, particularly if you're gonna take an employment action based on someone's physical state in some way or another. It's a very broad uh, definition of disability and, that, and it's the same definition of employment and housing. So it can include things like depression and anxiety and you know, those are real disabilities. It's, and, but you do need, uh, or you can ask for as a landlord or, or other housing provider or realtor or agent, um, you know, medical uh, evidence supporting this and that it would help the person use and enjoy the premises. And the way this got stuck um, in, in a, a few years ago in that second department case that I was telling you about is, well, yeah, okay, it's clearly they need it. There's no question they need it. Their doctor said they needed it. Uh, it, it improves uh, their life, but how does that have anything to do with the apartment? That's not like getting in the apartment with a ramp. And if you have to move in order to have your support animal, then you're not using and enjoying the premises, right? Uh, and that, and that was changed at the same time, a few months before the legislative change that made it clear that it's, uh, to, it's to help someone alleviate the symptoms of a disability. That's what use and enjoy means. Um, that it, so the legislature was changed, but just before that, the Court of Appeals also agreed with the division's interpretation, which again was broader. Liberal construction applies across the board. So you can certainly get medical evidence. It doesn't have to be from a medical doctor. It can be from a psychologist or psychiatric social worker or something like that. And by the way, there are certainly medical, you know, physical medical conditions uh, that, that uh, require this as well. And, you know, we've had cases where someone's had bypass surgery, for example, and, and a doctor will say, get a dog. I want you to be out walking that dog. And, and you know, they, they get 
uh, threatened with eviction from their apartment because the doctor said get a dog and it really helps their medical uh, physical medical state as well. Thank you, Caroline. You know, I think we are kind of out of time for questions. I think but, we are. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've put the link in our chat uh, on our sources of income guidance. And I'm just going to put our contact information in the chat as well. Feel free to email us or call us. Great. Well, thanks okay. so much for your attention, everyone. And, and uh, I really appreciate your organization uh, paying attention to these important issues and, and we want to work with you and help however we can. Okay, a special thank you, Ms. Downey, to you and your colleagues, Manny and Ron, for an insightful and very important presentation. Thank you, thank you, Lynette. Thanks everybody, Phil and all, for arranging this. Really appreciate it. I think we're gonna sign off because we have an 11 o'clock meeting but I think you're continuing and, and uh, good luck to all of you and stay well. Thank you. I'd, I'd now like to turn this program over to our HDAR president, Crystal Hawkins Cisco. Crystal is joined by Mike O'Connor and LaShawn McCalla, both landlords and property managers who will share their experience working with tenants who participate in sub housing subsidy programs. Of course, she acts up right when I have to speak, right? <laughs> She's been sleeping this whole time. Welcome everyone. And I'm glad that you are here to attend this very important meeting um, on source of income. And now we're gonna speak to individuals who are practitioners in the field as landlords. So I have a question to you both. Um, how long have you all been renting to tenants to participate in the housing subsidy program? Uh, well, for me, it's been just under 10 years. Wow, 10 years. And Mike? Mike, you are muted. We'll come back to Mike. All right, about that, folks. Um, right, there we go. Um, I've, been, I've been renting since 2008. 2008. So definitely some wealth of experience with the both of you here. So if you can actually share with us what has been your experience with tenants who have been part of the housing, um, who have housing subsidy programs? It's been a very positive experience. Um, you know, I treat them no different than I would treat a cash client. Uh, my landlords that, I have landlords that prefer uh, vouchers. And I also, you know, um, I have a preference for certain vouchers that I know uh, pay out well and consistently. So um, it's as a landlord, it's been uh, just like everything else, which is, you know, I want to emphasize as a realtor that there really is no difference. And if anything, it can be more secure than, um, you know, a cash client at times, depending on your pool of applicants. Um, I would say that, you know, the only difference would be maybe some of the paperwork, but either way, you still have to do an application, whether it be cash or program, you still need to submit paperwork. Um, but when you obviously when you have a program, you need to submit your paperwork to the local municipality for approval. So that would be the only difference. How about for you? Mike? But I apologize for not being on video, everyone. My my laptop was on the first time on my desktop. It does not have a camera, so uh, I apologize. I, I look like I sound. So <laughs> I can figure it out. Um, yeah, but I have rented exclusively uh, since I since owning and managing the building to uh, subsidized tenants. So I really don't have any any way of comparison. Um, I can tell you that over the years, I've I've managed to. Uh, learn how to navigate the system. Uh, when I first started, I was renting exclusively to tenants with Section 8 subsidies. Um, Section 8, in my opinion, has gotten exponentially better in the last four or five years in how you deal with them. Um, and more recently, I've been going through realtors who have relationships with social service agencies, like Beacon Watts, for example. Um, and, and going through realtors has been a, a, a much easier experience for me. Uh, when getting tenants who are subsidized, but I still, uh, I still also um, use Section Eight, exclusive uh, Section Eight tenants, um, because I've, I've actually learned how to navigate that system. And as I said, it's, I think it's, uh, they've got a, they've made some really vast improvements in the last four years. There, I, I think it's 
been a positive experience overall. So that actually goes into <coughs> answering the question that I um, wanted to share about, or a question I had about the advantages of being a lord, landlord, but can you talk to what are some of the challenges in terms of working with the programs? Sure, I, I, I can start off on that. Um, the challenges really have been have been remedied in, in the past year. The challenges in the past, particularly with Section 8, um, was the lack of communication and the lack of cooperation uh, by Section 8 with landlords. Um, we really, if we had any issues with tenants, we were kind of on our own. Um, the inspection process and the our ability to rectify any any deficiencies in the apartment that the semi-annual inspection found was really arduous, very laborious, very time-consuming uh, because most everything was done via you know U.S. mail. Um, they, in the past few years, have upgraded their systems, allowing us to get feedback from an apartment inspection immediately, um, which allows us to kind of correct anything that's found. And then we're able now to upload the paperwork to the landlord portal uh, after having it signed by the tenant and having, having the tenant confirm that the repairs were made. And, um, and then, you know, that issue is kind of put to bed. We're in the past. It would take, you wouldn't find out for a week uh, or, or better what the deficiencies in the apartment were during the inspection. And if you didn't have the paperwork back to them via US mail, or if you wanted to take an afternoon and go down to Section 8 and wait online, you could do that. Um, your rent would be suspended for a month. So I, I went for a period of years there where anytime there was an inspection in the apartment and any kind of deficiency was found, I ended up losing or, or having a month's rent delay. Um, they have done an excellent job of fixing that. Um, the, the challenges and, and, and part of those challenges still exist. And one of the reasons I went with uh, the route of dealing with realtors who, again, have relationships with social services um, is because the realtor, in effect, is a, is a go between. But more importantly, the person whose rent is being subsidized, the social service agency, generally has someone that's working with them. So if I have an issue with a tenant, um, I can contact the person at the agency that's working with them, and they can kind of act as a, as a mediator if, if there's an issue. Uh, and by the same token, the tenant has that person. If they feel I'm being deficient, or there's something wrong with the apartment that I'm not addressing uh, in a timely manner, I will get a call from their person, their contact at the social service agency, saying, hey, um, you know, your tenant called me about the refrigerator that, you know, I had an example, you know, three months ago, and it had a refrigerator that was on the fridge. So fortunately, you can't find refrigerators anywhere. So I had to assure them, listen, I'm doing my best. I'm trying to find a refrigerator to get it in place, but because of the shortages, uh, you know, I can't. So, you know, there, there have been challenges, but I think anyone who's doing this long enough and anyone starting out now um, doing it, I think will have much fewer challenges than, than I've faced in the past simply because the, the processes are being implemented. So what, what would advice would both of you give our members uh, as it relates to working with tenants who are part of a housing subsidy program? Uh, I would give members advice in, and tell them that when they take a listing, they need to sell in both cash and program as an option for renting. Um, I find that many agents are resistant to working with programs and that's, you know, that's not to their landlord's advantage, especially in an economy that is um, very topsy-turvy. Uh, agents need to understand that not only should we, uh, we should facilitate all options for renting, whether it be cash and program. I'm, you know, I'm not sure why a lot of agents uh, don't do that, but I think they need to understand that when they list a property, uh, they need to consider all options for their landlord. That's in the best interest of their landlord and not to um, object or to have a negative, um, you know, inclination towards uh, the program uh, source of income. I agree completely, Sean. I, I think there's a stigma among landlords for subsidized tenants. And I think, I think 
uh, the realtors need to kind of educate them uh, around that. Um, you know, again, my experience, I've had over the years dozens of tenants, right? Some were, some were problematic, but for the most part, you know, everyone was great. And for me as a landlord, and LaShawn, I think you mentioned this earlier, you know, the comfort of having the bulk of your rent pretty much guaranteed every month certainly, you know, negates any potential aggravation or potentially potentially different additional work that you might have. Um, you know, I've always budgeted my buildings where I, I, you know, I budget them counting on the subsidized portion of the rent because I do realize people get jammed up, they get in trouble, they, you know, they, they, they can't live up to their obligations. Um, but, you know, I, I think the benefits certainly outweigh the risk uh, of, of renting this house. That, that's my opinion as a landlord. I agree. You know, and I wanted to see if both of you could talk to this. Um, my experience has been with a few of my landlords that in the midst of COVID-19, the ones who were carrying more Section 8 units are actually faring significantly better than those who just have cash um, clients. Um, can you, either one of you talk to that? Has that been your experience in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah, not only have, have, I, have has the subsidized payment not been missed, but I have, knock wood, I have not had a single tenant default on me on any portion of their rent throughout COVID. I have been very, very fortunate as a landlord. Not one person, I had one tenant call me and ask me if I could take a double up the, the next month because they couldn't make it this month. That was the only blip in my radar. Um, and, uh, so I consider myself extremely fortunate. I know some other landlords who are certainly not that one. Yeah. Yeah, that, so that's, that's mm -hmm. a Go good ahead, point. That, that's a very good point. Um, you know, I'm sure all landlords who are getting subsidies have been doing well. Um, you know, we hope it continues. And the reason I say we hope it continues is because um, there's different source of funding for programs. So you have your HUD program, which is your federal source program, and your local uh, like DSS, your local county uh, state funded programs. So as long as those local municipality budgets stay in place, um, then there shouldn't be any interruption to rent payments. Now, can it happen and has it happened in the past where uh, cities like New York have uh, lost funding for programs? Yes, they have. And that means that you are, are not gonna collect rent but they give you a lot of warning. You get like up to a year uh, before their budgets uh, change dramatically. And it usually happens with the incoming mayors. So if the mayor changes, then sometimes the budgets usually change. And so, um, you know, the priorities really change where they funnel the money. But other than that, with the HUD programs like Section 8, <clears throat> I've never seen any stop payment. Uh, but local programs, uh, I have seen it before, but I haven't seen it yet. Well, for this I just mention something. Well, Sean, you brought up a good point because I, um, with some real, real world experience on that, a few years ago, I had a tenant that was with a local program. That program lost its funding. They had ample notice. And that tenant ended up going to Catholic Charities and saying, hey, you know, I don't want to lose my apartment. Um, and Catholic Charities ended up taking over their responsibility. Uh, so as long as you can kind of guide your tenant in that direction, and as you said, there's plenty of plenty of time for them to do that. Because um, the last thing I want to do is lose a good tenant. So I would say I would make a suggestion to them: go to Catholic Charities, go to Lincoln Watts, reach out to some sort of search agency, and explain your situation. And those people have taken over those responsibilities. So, uh, there's a lot of ways to a lot of ways to assist your your tenant uh, in getting their subsidy. Thank you. Yeah, so I hope our, our members actually heard what was expressly stated. So just to share with you how this can extend to us as liabilities as agents, imagine if you're one of those agents that discouraged your clients from actually taking a Section 8 voucher. Those landlords can come back to you now for damages because they may have been sorely hit by COVID with cash paying clients. Can you imagine that? I mean, this is how far extending that can go in terms of our responsibility to the public. And then to speak a little bit to the point about 
actually financing for certain programs, that's where, you know, I, I want to make a plug here. This is where the Realtors Political Action Committee funds come in, because as we talk to legislators in terms of helping support housing, our funds can go to support those candidates who actually will keep the funding going, allowing individuals who have modest incomes um, or reduced income to still have housing, which is something that is a part of our legislative agenda as an organization. So I just wanted to put that out there. So in, in closing, I just wanna know, is there anything else that you guys would like to share that you think it would be beneficial for our members? Uh, oh, no, I, I think like, like you said earlier, just, you know, job is to educate the landlord and let them understand that you know whatever prejudice that they may have or, or think that they may have against so the people with subsidies um they really need to get past those and understand that you know it's about for me as a landlord obviously right it's to make money but more importantly it's to give people you know a safe place to live i've had plenty of people coming out of homeless shelters with children and you know just to you know to to realize that you're you're helping someone in that regard uh, it is very rewarding. And from a pure dollars and cents standpoint, as I said, uh, I really don't think that the risk, I think the benefits certainly outweigh the risks. Uh, yes, I agree. And, you know, as agents, we need to be facilitators. We shouldn't let our own personal or political beliefs get in the way of, of people renting. Um, our job is to facilitate a deal and not to impart our own, um, you know, belief system. And, you know, most people should understand that, you know, programs are there to help people who are working people, people who have an income, as well as, you know, non-working people, people on uh, disability income. And so anybody at any point in their life have to use some sort of subsidy to help themselves and you know we, we we're fortunate if we we don't have to have that and but it's not something that um realtors should get in the way if anything realtors should get on board because um realtors should like to do deals um a lot of the subsidy programs pay more than a month you know with the city of new york you get a month and a half on your commission and the landlord can get a bonus and some of the landlords can get like six months rent up front. So it could work out even better than, you know, regular rent, but the realtors need to change their mindset. Thank you so, um, so much, both of you for sharing your Crystal. insights and experiences. Now we'd like to turn over to Lynn. Lynette. Uh, Crystal, before you um, end, could you talk about the Fair Housing Challenge? Oh, yes. So listen, all, all you guys out there, as the president of the art organization, we've had a fair housing challenge that's been extended to the end of the year. And it's following in line um, with some of the initiatives that are coming from Charlie Opler, who is our National Association of Realtors president. And so essentially what we're looking for you as members to do is um, at least one, excuse me, oops, one, oops. Let me just pass this on. She's getting a little fussy. Can you just take it for a second? <laughs> Sorry. The Fair Housing Challenge. And so it's one of our three initiatives that are coming from NAR. One is to complete the Fair, ha uh, Fair Haven Fair Housing Simulation. I've taken it and many people in my office. It's a video guided tour with question and answers to help you actually go through case study examples and see how you would respond and heighten your ability to be sensitive to those in our marketplace. The second is to view NAR's um, implicit bias training video. This was given by um, uh, an institute that does study in actually neurosciences. Indispensable in understanding how we work as humans and how we can challenge some of our automatic responses. And the last, and I really, really challenge you all to definitely go the extra mile and get at the at home with diversity certification. Um, I think that it, as a practitioner in, that's been in the business for about 18 years, it definitely even changed me and opened my mind up to better ways to service our, our public. So please, please take advantage of the Fair Housing Challenge and support and advocate and be champions of Fair Housing. Thank you, Crystal. 
Well, uh, this concludes our program and I'd like to thank all members for attending. Thank you. So long, everyone.